Welcome to the Participatory Medicine Learning Exchange. Today's topic is family caregivers, innovative new resources, and things you did not know. Now, this topic really affects everyone because as they say, there are four types of people in the world. Those who are currently caregivers, those who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who need caregivers. Next slide, please. Hang on, Sarah, Evan, I don't see the slides. There we go. Okay. Thank you. So I'm Sarah Krug. I'm the exa uh, Acting Executive Director of the Society for Participatory Medicine. Uh, I'm also the CEO of Cancer 101 and founder of the Health Collaboratory. And uh, our moderators today, it's an honor to introduce uh, Mary Ann Sterling and Jerry Lynn Baumblatt. So Mary Ann was a caregiver and healthcare advocate for her uh, parents for over 20 years. She and her husband have struggled with three out of four parents diagnosed with dementia. She serves as a patient research partner and ambassador for PCORI, an advisor for the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Patient and Caregiver Powered Research Network bringing the voices of patients and family caregivers to medical research. Marianne is also VP of Caregiver Experience at LivePact. And Jerry Lynn uh, Baumblatt helped care for her father for several years and currently helps care for her 85-year-old mother. She has worked to design resources to improve patient, family, and clinician engagement, health literacy, and shared decision-making for over 20 years. Jerry oversaw the development of the ME Multimedia Patient Engagement Library and currently consults on health communication and patient and family engagement. She's partnering with the Society for Participatory Medicine to understand how family caregiving impacts health organizations and how it impacts the nurses they employ who often need to balance work and caring for people in their own family. Now, before we begin, uh, if you can go to the next slide. I'd like to discuss the history behind the learning exchange. Uh, so participatory medicine, for those who don't know, is a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to responsible uh, drivers of their health and in which providers encourage and value them as full partners. SPM's mission is to catalyze collaborative partnerships across the continuum of care to optimize health and healthcare. And the society's foundation is based upon four pillars, which include community building, advocacy and policy, research and education, uh, which ironically spell out care, and uh, we actually did not do that on purpose. Now, to learn more, I encourage you to visit our website, and the beauty of these goals is that many of you are already out there working on these pillars and advancing participatory medicine. Next slide, please. So the learning exchange was created to help you showcase your work. Understanding the work we're conducting in our individual silos can help us learn from one another, allow us to build upon ideas, forge collaborations, provide a forum for be feedback and suggestions, and hopefully avoid duplication of efforts. The learning exchange allows us to also capture how we're collectively moving the participatory medicine needle, whether it's through our day-to-day -day personal experiences with healthcare or our work in this area. And all of the learning exchange webinars are recorded and you'll be able to view the archive of today's presentation as well. Next slide. And many thanks to our sponsors, uh, Accenture and Vocera. Vocera, who is also hosting our technicals through WebEx, um, offers the leading platform for clinical communication and workflow, and their mission is to simplify and improve the lives of healthcare professionals and patients while enabling hospitals to enhance quality of care. And Accenture, which is a Fortune Global 500 company, is a global management consulting and professional services firm that provides strategy, consulting, digital technology, and operation services in over uh, 120 countries. Next slide. So we have a packed agenda, several amazing speakers. Feel free to type in your questions in the question box on your panel throughout the presentation. And we'll try to get through as many as possible during the Q&A that will be held at the very end. And now I'll turn it over to today's moderators, Marianne Sterling and Jerry Lynn uh, Bamblett. Marianne, over to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Welcome, everybody. We want to set the stage for our discussion today with a clear definition of who family caregivers represent. They're just everyday people who are stepping in to help family members, friends, and neighbors navigate health challenges. Depending on whose statistics you believe, we have somewhere between 43 and a half 
and 127 million family caregivers in this country. We wanted to bring your attention to a humbling statistics on youth caregivers that you see on the upper right, and also highlight the proportion of caregivers in the workplace. Can you believe it? One in six. This is what we do, and we assimilate an enormous amount of information along the way. I can't think of better partners for the healthcare system than family caregivers. Jerry? Yeah. So one of the things that's important to understand with family caregivers is there's a lot of things they don't know. Um, the first one is they often don't self-identify as family caregivers. I'm actually a perfect example of this. I worked in healthcare, and I didn't really recognize that my mom wasn't the only one caring for my dad, that I was also a caregiver, which makes it really hard to look for resources and get help when you don't recognize this about yourself. Another thing family caregivers often are not prepared for is social isolation. Um, I experienced this both in my personal life. You know, you're taking all your free time and weekends. I was traveling up to Wisconsin. Uh, helping with care, but also you don't want to call people often because you don't want to be the depressing person they're talking to. And I also found that I started to even social isolate at work because I was stressed out and always on the phone, so people just kind of naturally started avoiding me. Um, family strife is another huge one. I've had friends who have lost their marriages, um, lost close relationships with family members, it can really be a big strain on family dynamics. Uh, impact on job and employment is huge. Uh, many people often don't stay employed, go part-time, uh, or at least don't feel like they have the time and bandwidth to do things like, you know, lead teams or, or, or apply for promotions. It can really have a huge impact. It has a lot of impact on your own health, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And then, obviously, we don't know how to connect with resources. Um, it's very hard to do. And even if you've done it with one family member for one situation, it can be completely different resources that you need for another situation. Next slide. So the duration of caregiving is also important to understand. Um, it's not just, oh, somebody had to have surgery and you're out for that week. Uh, average caregiving is four plus years. Median is five years. And if you're caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, it's often more like 10 to 15 years. So these are long-term situations people are entering. Next slide. Uh, the health effects of caregiving is huge. Um, a large number of people, about 40 to 50% experience depression and anxiety from it. Over 40% also experience sleep issues, which is non-trivial when you consider that sleep is the number one thing for your health and happiness. Uh, health risk behaviors increase. People are more likely to smoke, drink, use drugs. They themselves have increased frailty. Uh, they often sustain injuries, moving people, lifting things, just engaging in the physical work of care. And they're more likely, unfortunately, to have strokes and heart attacks um, and other issues. Uh, the social isolation we mentioned before, which also, though, has its own health effects we now know. And there are positive aspects of this as well. Uh, people can sometimes have closer relationships, um, more competence, and improved sense of well-being. So how do we really amplify the positive and minimize the negative? Next slide. Uh, the value of unpaid caregivers is non-trivial. It's $470 billion. So when you think about this and look at the next slide, uh, you really see that if family caregivers were to go on strike tomorrow, a uh, uh, whole healthcare system would go down. They're really just providing a huge layer of ongoing care throughout care transitions and every part of care. So Maryam, back to you. Thanks, Jerry. So I am so excited uh, to introduce our speakers today. This is an amazing group. Uh, first, we have Zena Paris. She's the uh, of Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles. She's going to be talking about the caregiver workshops uh, that um, Alzheimer's Greater LA provide. Next, 
Raj Mehta, CEO of Atlas of Caregiving. He's going to talk about care maps, a new concept I think you guys will be really excited about. Anne Montgomery from Alterum is going to give us a uh, overview of the caregiver legislative landscape on Capitol Hill. There's a lot of important legislation uh, that is um, uh, very important uh, for family caregivers to pay attention to right now. And of course, Denise Brown from caregiving.com, she's going to tell us about the National Caregiving Conference. But first up, Zena, again from Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles. Zena, take it away. Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to introduce you to Alzheimer's disease and introduce you to um, what kinds of services we have at Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles. Some of these services can be found nationally, and some of them are located here in California. Um, and just to let you know a little bit more about what the disease is like. Next slide. So a lot of people, their first question is, what is dementia and what is Alzheimer's and what is the difference? And so dementia is the umbrella term. So for example, you might call something a flower, but there's a lot of different kinds of flowers. There might be a forget-me-not, there might be a daisy, there might be a rose. And um, those are the different types of dementia. Alzheimer's makes up 50 to 75 percent of the type of, of, is the type of dementia that's the most common. It's followed by vascular dementia. There's also dementia with Lewy bodies. There's frontotemporal. Um, all of these start in different areas of the brain, but they are all progressive. So as time goes on, it becomes a little less important what type of dementia you have. And there are also several hundred other types of dementia which smaller numbers of people have. Next slide. So we're going to go ahead and watch a video that will explain to you about Alzheimer's. Folks, if you have your computer speakers turned down, please turn them on so you can hear the audio of the video.
Hi again, next slide. So um, thank you for watching that. I think it's very um, uh, self-explanatory and really gives you an overview of what Alzheimer's disease is. It is incurable right now. It is progressive. Um, scientists are working on it. However, I wanted to go ahead and let you know that actual changes take place in the brain. It's not just a disease of forgetting, um, which is what we often think of it as. And the slide of the normal brain, you can see all the brain mass that's there and compare that to a slide of the brain that has late stage Alzheimer's. And you can actually see there is literal space where brain matter used to be. So when you're a caregiver and you're dealing with somebody who has dementia and they are speaking to you in ways or behaving in ways that are hard to understand or upsetting to you, it's helpful to know that there really is something going on inside of the brain that's causing this. Next slide. So there are a number of risk factors. Age is really the biggest one. The older we get, the more at risk we are for developing dementia. And now that people are living longer, um, the incidence of Alzheimer's is increasing. And it is a huge tsunami, uh, as they sometimes call it, that will be affecting both the US and Nash internationally. Gender is another one. Females are more likely to uh, come down with Alzheimer's. They're not quite sure why that is. Um, genetics plays a part. And other health conditions, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, if you've had a previous head injury, or if you're diagnosed with Down syndrome. And there's no uh, cause that has been found yet for Alzheimer's disease. They don't know exactly what causes it. They are studying that, but these are things that are correlated with increasing risk. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about the programs and services that are out there to support you as the caregiver. Um, we have a lot of education and outreach and support that we offer. One of the things is we have a helpline where people can just call in. They can get information, emotional support, resources, referrals. We talk by phone. We also have a web chat, which is online, and people can go online and just communicate with somebody here at the office by typing in their questions and concerns. Um, that's available to anybody across the country, and um, the phone number should be on the slide. I guess it's not, but I'll go ahead and let you know what it is, and we'll make sure that everybody has that. Um, I think it's on the last slide, 844-435-7255. Five, nine, and that's 844-HELP-ALLS. And next slide. We also offer care counseling. That is an individualized program where you get to talk one-on-one -on -one with a social worker here. And they can help you with care planning. They can help you with figuring out what to do next. They can help you with, um, if you are a person with dementia is refusing to do something, how do you get around that? all sorts of things like that. Next slide. Support groups are um, all over the country. Here in LA, we're lucky to have very a no, great number of support groups, um, but they are across the country. And these are safe places for caregivers or those who are um, living with a dementia. So people who are in the early stages of the dementia could still participate in a support group and they can gather and share information in a safe, non-judgmental place. Next slide. Early stage services, again, are for those who are in the early stages of the disease and their care partners. Um, information, education, um, and talking about what are the feelings and concerns that go along with um, just getting a diagnosis of dementia it can be very scary. Next slide. Memory Mornings is an activity program that is just in LA and we provide uh, activities and socialization for people who are in the mid stages of Alzheimer's disease. And it's for the person with dementia as well as their caregivers. It gives their caregivers a chance to socialize too. Next slide. Memories in the Making is another program. 
uh, people who have dementia are able to make art and um, it's a way to communicate when verbal communication starts to not be as easy for them. Next slide. Savvy Caregiver is an evidence-based three to six week educational program. And this is really to teach the caregivers how to be a caregiver. It's to learn about Alzheimer's disease. It's to learn about how to find a way to be a little bit more objective and take things a little bit less personally when you're dealing with somebody who maybe at times is agitated or confused. And um, what we call the idea of it is that we want to bring people into a state where they are contentedly involved, maybe not every day of the week, maybe not every moment of the day, um, but where there are things that they can do that are uh, parallel their level of ability and um, that can make them feel that they are actively engaged and still have their work be meaningful. Um, and these are um, in the LA area, but um, some of it has been duplicated nationwide. And I can give you more information on that uh, later at the end if you'd like. Next slide. In community education, we go out, we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we talk about education, we talk about what are the symptoms to look for. Next slide. And professional training for those who are um, in the field of taking care of older adults, and we provide training for them to know more about Alzheimer's disease and um, how to deal with it. Next slide. And so that's it for Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you very much, Dina. All right, first, a gentle reminder to everyone, please type in your questions uh, for our presenters using the chat function of WebEx. You'll find that in the upper right corner of the tool. Uh, so definitely um, use that and anything that uh, you'd like to ask, type in those questions and we'll answer them at the end. Next up, Raj Mehta from Atlas of Caregiving. Take it away, Raj. Thanks, Marianne. So hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be speaking about family caregiving at the Society of Participatory Medicine. But while we speak of wanting to improve how patients and families participate in care, do we really understand what current participation looks like? As you'll see, a care map is a diagram that helps you see your own care ecosystem, who is involved and what they do. We have discovered that not only is this a powerful tool for individual and family empowerment, but also a powerful tool for building and strengthening community. Next slide. A care map can be drawn by hand. That's how most people get started. There's also a digital version that provides much more power for both drawing and seeing. And these are the key questions you ask yourself to begin to discover who is involved. The first one is who all do you care for? Not just those with serious conditions, but also the sick pet cat and the friend you're helping because he was an overenthusiastic skier. Who else cares for them and who cares for you? The care map emphasizes presence, who is nearby and who is involved a lot. And you're encouraged to think about all kinds of care. The grandson who makes you laugh, the, the neighbor who comes over for a cup of tea, the cousin who can seemingly find any information you need online, the friends who are always willing to drive you someplace. Most people discover that they live within a complex web of care. People discover that almost everyone is simultaneously a caregiver and a care recipient and doing health care. They discover these terms are often unhelpful, hiding important truths. Next slide. How did care maps come about? Uh, to tell the story briefly and to start somewhere, in 2014, I had organized an expert roundtable. The iceberg metaphor was used to highlight one of the most important conclusions, that families do almost all the work of care, but their contribution is hidden. A lot of attention is focused on, and over $3 trillion is spent on, the healthcare industry, but almost nothing is known about family caregiving. To some, that is a heretical statement, but we're not going to make much progress if we continue to ignore the shallowness of our knowledge. 
Relatively speaking, caregiving is a data-free zone. It seems unlikely that we can really do a great job of helping families if we don't even understand their situation. We also acknowledge a lack of social conversation, that people generally don't talk with each other about their personal caregiving situations, which means that we're not benefiting from each other's support and wisdom. And so this led to the creation of the Atlas of Caregiving Nonprofit to conduct deep research on family caregiving and to develop tools that families could use to better understand themselves. Next slide. We've put together a team with deep expertise in a wide variety of fields in technology and business, design and anthropology, family caregiving and health. And we've had some great funders and collaborators. Next slide. In 2015-16, we conducted a pilot to test some of our ideas for collecting, analyzing, and visualizing rich family caregiving data with a very diverse set of families. One of the novel tools we developed was the care map. The cover of our report featured one family's care map. We discovered that people, including the families themselves, really liked their care map, and people wanted to create their own. This led us to develop a hand-drawn method and to continue to improve and refine the concept. Next slide which led to a deep collaboration with several organizations in Santa Barbara to explore the value of care maps. We work with social workers from a local social services agency and a hospital. We work with the Promotores, a grassroots organization. Atlas had led many two-hour care map workshops in which we teach people how to draw their own care maps. In these deeply designed workshops, we create an environment where people openly talk with each other about their situations. The success of those workshops led to a demand for train the trainer sessions so that people in Santa Barbara could themselves teach others in the community. Next slide. So what's been the impact? Almost everyone who has reflected on the key questions and drawn their care map has told us they had a richer understanding of their situation. Of course, some have discovered that their situation was even worse than they had thought, becoming more aware of their isolation and a sense of overwhelming burden. On the other hand, many have felt a sense of gratitude as they discovered that they had been overlooking many others involved and providing support. Next slide. The impacts, the level of self-discovery has been far more dramatic for those who have attended our workshops. The experience of describing your situation to others and of hearing about other people's situations seems to make a big difference in one's own understanding. This has also sparked an appreciation for peer-to-peer -peer conversations. More on this in a moment. Next slide. Social workers and other professionals in the health and social services fields have found care maps very useful in their work with clients. It helps them better understand the families they serve and the experience of drawing the care map together helps create better rapport. Seeing this impact, other organizations in the Santa Barbara region have also adopted care maps. In fact, the local area agency on aging is now requiring all grantees to use care maps in their work. Next slide. The most dramatic impact, however, has come through organic community adoption of care maps through the promotores. Many of the promotores have described the impact of care maps in seeing their situations more clearly, leading to changes in perspective and action as life-changing. And so they have taught care maps to their relatives, their friends, their coworkers, and others in the community. Talking about care is now a much more normal part of social conversation. They use care maps whenever appropriate in interactions with the community, not just in narrow, medically focused caregiving situations, but wherever human care is important. I've heard stories of care maps being very helpful with single mothers, with pregnant teens, and a terrible situation of a fourth grader whose parents had been deported. Next slide. As word has gotten out about the impact of care maps in Santa Barbara, We've been invited to speak about care maps and to lead care map workshops in many places across the globe, and others are starting to incorporate care maps into their work. Next slide. All this interest, these conversations have helped us characterize the impact of care maps. At the individual level, care maps help people see the interconnected nature of their lives. They appreciate how others are contributing to their well-being. They see the assets they have access to. Just as importantly, they come to appreciate the gifts they bring to their community 
how they are contributing to others' well-being. We have also seen through the experience of our workshops and especially through the example of the promotores that care maps can have a huge impact on community. They spark social conversation about care and community, things hidden and unsaid, often out of fear that no one else would understand, are becoming public as people discover their shared humanity. We speak of the consequence as unleashing community wisdom, as people discover they have so much they can learn from each other. Next slide. This has led us to reach out to experts in community, experts such as John McKnight and Peter Block. A community is fundamentally about a sense of belonging. You feel a part of a community and you know that others feel you are part of the community. A community is fundamentally about care. You care about the well-being of the community, of the others in your community, and you know that others care about your well-being. Without this mutual sense of care, you don't have community, you just have a group of people. So we've come to the conclusion that care maps are fundamental to community building efforts as they help people see the web of care that already exists. They help people build upon the goodness that they can see already exists. Next slide. So as you think about the possible value of care maps for your own work, keep in mind a few things. The value is not simply in the tool itself, in the drawing and the mechanics of drawing, but in the underlying concepts of family and community about what constitutes care, about the importance of presence and the fundamental importance of social conversation. There's also the importance of the fundamental, though often latent, value of community wisdom. Experts are important, yes, but only in their narrow fields. For day-to-day -day life, the experts are those who share your day-to-day -day experiences. So how would your own efforts benefit from an engaged and thriving community? And next slide. So um, thank you for listening and please follow up if you're interested in collaborating. Thanks, Raj. Next up, Anne Montgomery from Alterum. She's going to give us the overview of the caregiver legislative landscape. Take it away, Anne. Greetings to you all. I'm Anne Montgomery, and I'm really glad to be here today with all of you. And I count myself very fortunate to work at a research organization that has a mission to create and advance evidence that can be used to implement systems change. In the case of our program, we define that change as that which is good for aging Americans. So we know that family caregivers play an outsized role in successful aging. They're absolutely foundational to a caring culture and a caring economy. And I think it's fair to say that we need to work harder and faster to achieve first-class performance in both of those areas. And with regard to policy, which is what I'm going to talk about today, although caregivers are frequently saluted for their efforts and praised for their work, substantial help has been rather slow in coming over the years. But however, we may be at a pivot point, which is why I use the term bright prospects on this slide. Next slide. So I hope all of you will take a moment to celebrate the enactment of the Ray's Family Caregivers Act earlier this year. It's designed to create a national strategy for family caregivers, and that's an exciting undertaking. My own feeling is that it will be much more meaningful if the advisory committee that is, <clears throat> excuse me, appointed seeks out public input in a comprehensive way. So I hope you all will weigh in. There's some delays getting the law implemented uh, because there was no funding included for it, and there's a little confusion about exactly how the Department of Health and Human Services will start the ball rolling. But with any luck, the Advisory Council, which will be composed of some federal agency officials and 15 members, will get started soon. And the Council is charged with developing a blueprint for an initial strategy 18 months after enactment. So that was January 2018, the enactment. So at this point, we have about a year. That's enough. Um, although we're six months behind, but it's enough, and it's helpful that we have recommendations and baseline analysis to work from in the form of a National Academy of Medicine report that was issued in September 2016, and I highly rec recommend taking a look at it if you haven't already. One key recommendation from that report is to develop, test, and implement provider payment reforms that motivate providers to engage family caregivers in delivery processes all across modes, various modes of payments, and models of care. And that's exactly the kind of work we do at Altarum. In addition to the RAISE Act, we also have pending legislation in the House for creating a nationwide volunteer care corps from two leading members of Congress, and both are women, uh, Representatives Michelle Lujan Grisham of New Mexico, a Democrat, and Representative uh, Elena Ross-Leighton of Florida, a Republican. That bill would charge HHS 
with establishing the infrastructure for a national care corps of trained volunteers who would then be deployed to communities to assist elders and others who are mainly homebound and their caregivers with companionship, household assistance, and other non-medical tasks. It's a great idea, and it sounds a little bit related to the care map ideas that we just heard about, so I'm thinking about that. I hope we can see it become law this year before those outstanding lawmakers leave Congress. Um, Lujan Grisham is running for governor, and Ross Leitonen is retiring after many years of public service. A couple of days ago, I was excited to hear uh, that Representative Lujan Grisham um, said at a forum where she was speaking that she secured $5 million as part of the fiscal year 2019 Labor HHS Appropriations Bill for a possible Care Corps program. And now she's working on the language needed to actually create or authorize such a program. So fingers crossed. And I should add that Altarum is also aiming to develop a toolkit that could be used to stand up local care corps or caregiver corps as we call them in a replicable standardized way. And one of the most important things to making that happen would be good training for volunteers and a toolkit would come in handy in that respect. In other legislation, we have proposals that are being debated to expand the Family Medical Leave Act, the Family Act, which is championed by Senator Kristen, Kristen Gillibrand of New York, is one. There's another proposal from Senator Marco Rubio of Florida and Joni Ernst of Iowa, which was the subject of a recent hearing before the Senate Finance Committee's Subcommittee on Social Security Pensions and family policy. Their approach is different. It would limit the scope of expanded leave to cover only new parents, and it would require those taking leave to pay for it out of their future Social Security reti retirement. So we'll see where the debate goes and if there's a compromise that's possible. Also on tap is the Credit for Caring Act, which I realize I don't have a bullet for here, but I want you to know about it. It's another policy area that has been really the subject of legislation for a number of years over many Congresses. The current version would make tax credits available at the $3,000 limit to family caregivers to offset the out-of-pocket costs of caring for someone, which we know are very high. That bill is backed by Senator Ernst of Iowa and Tom Reed of New York, and it's very bipartisan. Then we have the BOLD Act, uh, which takes a public health approach to dementia, which we heard a lot about a few minutes ago, by proposing to establish centers of excellence across the country and funding public health departments to do a lot more on early detection and diagnosis and to promulgate risk reduction strategies and avoidable hospitalizations and support care planning that takes the needs of family caregivers into account. Okay, next slide. Here we see some more good news. The Lifespan Respite Care Reauthorization Act is pending, and I think it's a good bet that this modest and mighty law will be extended. Probably all of you know that it supports respite systems in most states, I think it's 37, through funding programs that create searchable databases for consumers, public awareness campaigns on what respite is and how to locate resources, and various other means of promoting better access. And some state programs, such as Illinois, offer emergency respite. We also have the VA Mission Act that was recently enacted, and that new law makes a number of improvements. Among them is an expansion of the VA's program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. This program has been limited to those who are caring for veterans serving after 9-11, and now it's going to be significantly expanded to include veterans of all generations, and that's excellent. The services are very comprehensive. They can include a financial stipend, access to health care insurance, mental health services, counseling, caregiver training, and respite. And on the last bullet, I want to say a word about the Chronic Care Act, which is teeing up a lot of change in Medicare. And this law basically opens up new flexibilities for Medicare Advantage plans, or HMOs, to offer a wide range of what we would consider to be long-term services and supports in the form of supplemental benefits. For caregivers, uh, it's good news that these supplemental benefits will be able to include in-home personal care, home modifications, and respite. It's really quite a shift in thinking uh, for the Medicare program, so stay tuned to see what Medicare Advantage plans do. It's up to them. It's voluntary. It probably won't do much in 2019, but certainly by 2020, we should be seeing some pretty interesting developments. Next slide. Meanwhile, as we all know, we have some midterm elections coming up and presidential elections not long after that. So how can we further accelerate momentum for caregiving in a tumultuous political climate? My vote is to further fire up the public about family caregivers and to make the case even clearer about their contributions to the caring economy. Why? Because we know that family caregivers provide, as we heard, 
hundreds of billions of dollars worth of services each year. So in an age of populism where there's 24-7 communication and people's voices can be pretty loud, what do we need to know about what family caregivers want? That's a question that we set, we set out to ask and answer in this project, the Family Caregiver Platform Project. The purpose was to collect ideas from regular people living outside the DC Beltway, lift up their voices and ideas and train them to become part of the policy making process. It was really fun. We essentially put together a nationwide nonpartisan project on a shoestring by using the energy and efforts of volunteers, people we knew, friends of friends who said, sure, they'd be glad to help. So when you have a moment, take a look at the website we put together. It's at caregivercore.org. It needs refreshing and updating at this point, and we'll be doing that uh, next year, which we'll get to in a minute. But the essence is that we populated the website with some great ideas that we picked up from the literature and from smart people like everybody on this webinar. We wrote up that information in the form of planks or policy statements that could be submitted to state party platform committees, both Democratic and Republican. And we also drafted language that could be introduced in the form of legislative resolutions. We trained people on uh, platforms just like this one, and we wound up with submissions in 29 states, and in 11 of those, either planks or legislative resolutions were approved. Uh, so the states colored in purple that you see here are those where submissions were made to Democratic platform committees, and Republican planks were submitted in the states that are orange. The striped states are where GOP and Democratic planks were submitted, and in the states with a circle and a line running through it, bipartisan legislative resolutions were put forward. And previous to this work, there was really only one state that had ever done any kind of work that included uh, family caregiver language, and that was the state of Hawaii. Next slide. So this is an excerpt of the language that the Mississippi legislature approved in 2016, uh, and that was on a bipartisan unanimous basis. You'll notice that there's a mention of a caregiver core in the third um, bullet there. It's the same idea that we talked about a minute ago that's embodied in the Care Core Act. And you can see how powerful these resolutions really are. And the challenge, I would say, at this point is to take this kind of energy, this sort of resolution, and take it forward into programs that can be implemented. So we want to do this work again, leading up to the 2020 election. It doesn't have to be in exactly the same way, although it could be. And we're going to be partnering with an organization that some of you may know. It's called Caring Across Generations. We want to make an even bigger impact and that means working with dynamic organizations and individuals. And love to work with you all. Anybody who's interested, please send me an email. Next slide, please. So here's what we know about what the public wants. And nothing has changed since this poll was done in uh, November 2016 on this subject. This is polling of Trump and Clinton voters on the eve of the election and on the day of the election in 2016. We bought two questions that were included in a large national poll conducted by Lake Research Partners, a Democratic polling firm, and they, they work with a GOP polling firm called the Terrence Group. And here are the results for the question on family caregivers. What you see here is that when presented with three options, the most popular answer was actually all of the above. And there was no partisan difference at all in the responses. Actually, all of the above was not an option. Uh, people volunteered that answer, which I'm told is unusual. And I think what it says very clearly is that family caregivers want all of these things and more. Next slide. So when we held a conference about all this in November 2016, just a week after the election, in addition to polling the public, we surveyed experts and stakeholders, I think Marianne was one of them, who signed up for the conference. And here's what they said they believe were the top priorities to assist family caregivers and to boost the direct care workforce which has growing supply gaps relative to need for services in the community as our population ages. And as you can see, these priorities track well with what the broader public wants. Next slide. Meanwhile, at the state level, states are moving into much higher gear with long-term care studies on tap in the state of Michigan, Maryland, Minnesota, and possibly others. Caregiver-specific legislation is also popular. This is a slide about Hawaii's Kapuna Caregivers Program that was enacted in 2017. It provides working family caregivers who are supporting an older adult with a stipend of about $70 a day to essentially defray the higher out-of-pocket costs that illness and disability impose on families. You can use that stipend to pay for home care aid, adult daycare, and transportation. And Caring Cross Generations worked hard on this, so hats off to them. I also want to give kudos to AARP, which has successfully pushed through legislation known as the CARE Act 
in many states across the country, which asks hospitals to name family caregivers and medical records and provide information to them for discharge so they can be better prepared to support a loved one who's leaving the hospital. And they're also working on state versions of some of the federal policy that we talked about earlier, guardianship issues, and some of the care delivery reform issues that Altarum also works on, and that's all great. Next slide. In closing, I just want to quickly kind of bring it all back and quickly spotlight a rural and low-income success story in Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. These are local elders, many of them needing services, and some who are also caregivers. These are the people that we're really all trying to help. And in the case of Zuni Pueblo, there are not many financial resources in terms of program funding, and the income of residents, including elders, is pretty low. But using ingenuity and determination, the stakeholders involved, and here I'm referring to local leaders, program heads, and advocates, have regular organized meetings in which they talk about all of the various programs in that community that help elders and their families. These programs have different requirements and sometimes conflicting requirements, I bet that sounds familiar. And the meetings focus to a good extent on how to deal with that, how to devise ways to maximize revenue that they do have. And they're now talking about how to create a residence in the Pueblo that will keep their frail elders as they get older from having to be placed out of the Pueblo in nursing homes far away. They're making it work pretty well, in other words, and I think we can do that too. And so I'm so glad to be working with you all, very grateful. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne. And next up, Denise Brown from caregiving.com, and she's going to talk about the National Caregiving Conference coming up soon. Take it away, Denise. Thanks, Mary Ann. So the third annual National Caregiving Conference is in November. We can go to the next slide. And I started the conference in December 2016 as a way to get together anyone who's in a caregiving experience, anyone who's been in a caregiving experience, and anyone who is interested in the experience of caregiving. What happens when we get together is we talk honestly about what it's like for us. We really focus on the impact of a caregiving experience. Because we know anyone can be in a caregiving experience, our conference reflects the diversity in terms of the ages of our attendees, the gender, the culture. And it's great because we all get together and talk about this is what it's like for me. We can go to the next slide, Marianne. One of the unique parts of the conference is that it's not only for those who are currently in a caregiving situation, but it's also for those who have had a caregiving experience and are adjusting to life after caregiving ends. You can imagine that there's not a lot of support around an individual who is trying to figure out, oh my gosh, I just spent years caring for someone. Now I have to step into next. What is that like? How do I manage that? So we have a track that's part of the conference that's just for those who are adjusting to life after caregiving ends. If you are interested in caregiving issues, this is a great conference to come to because it's all about the caregiving experience. We look at it from different perspectives, all tied to a theme of this is what it's like for me. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Because we're the experts, we're also the presenters at the conference. I really wanted it to be a conference that we went to where we connected to others in a similar situation who also delivered content around what it's like. When I launched caregiving.com, I was really focused on the voice of family caregivers. And when we added blogs, it's family caregivers who blog. It's former family caregivers who blog. It is their voice that is ever present on the website. And I wanted that to be part of the conference. I didn't want it to feel like we go to a conference where we hear others tell us what they think it's like for us. We go to a conference where we hear, okay, this is what it's like for me. What's it like for you? Former family caregivers and family caregivers make up about 90% 90, 90 of the presentations at the conference. They're either delivering a presentation or part of a panel discussion around caregiving issues. 
We can go to the next slide, Miriam. So our, our theme this year is our best selves. Our theme in 2017 was our boldest hours. Last year, we really focused on how do we really step in, up and be courageous during a caregiving experience. We are courageous when we make those tough decisions, when we say those hard words, when we set those difficult boundaries. This year, I wanted it to be about how do we find our best during a time that feels like the worst. All the sessions, in some regard, draw in that theme. We have panel discussions around how do we be our best during the difficult days like diagnosis day, a tough day in the hospital, and our carries end of life. In addition, we have a special summit that's part of the conference that's called Caregiving in the Workplace. It's a three-hour summit that looks at what's the impact on our careers when we're in a caregiving experience. And Jerry is going to talk a little bit about research she's doing around healthcare professionals who are also in a personal caregiving experience and how that research is going to tie into the summit. Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, could you go back? Sorry, Marianne. Can you go back one more? There we go. So Dr. Sam Harrington wrote this great book called At Peace, and it's about finding peace at the end of our Carrie's long life. And he's going to deliver a presentation about letting go of this responsibility that we have to keep our Carrie's alive at all costs. Dr. Harrington is actually part of our live broadcast. You can join us in Chicago, November 8th through November 11th. You can also watch virtually for free November 9th and November 10th. Our general sessions will be part of the live broadcast, including Dr. Harrington's presentation. We also have a full day dementia care track, and we have a keynote presenter on the morning of November 10th, who is actually a family caregiver who's won our contest. We will open up our keynote contest for voting beginning next week. In essence, we've asked family caregivers and former family caregivers to submit a video for the chance to be a presenter, and then we vote on our favorite. So even our keynote is either currently in a caregiving situation or previously. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So those are the dates, November 8th through 11th in Chicago. The virtual broadcast is November 9th and 10th. If you'd like more details, that's the address on our website, and our hashtag is NCC18. And I hope to see you there. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity to share about the conference. I'm so grateful for this chance. Thanks, Denise. And Jerry has uh, something to share with us on a little bit of research that's going on. Right, so very quickly, if you're a nurse, there is a survey for you to take about any past or current caregiving experiences, how that's affected your work-life balance. And also for anybody who works in nurse management or in leadership at a hospital or healthcare organization, there's a survey for you as well. So please check those out. But I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So we had a few questions come in. Um, a couple very quickly for Rajiv, and type any others you have in the chat window. Uh, Rajiv, you had a couple questions asking what the approximate rate of caregiver part participation has been in the Care Map workshops, and who are the biggest adapter of Care Maps? Is it just everyday people, social workers, or clinical teams using this? Um, so the answer to the first question about the rate of caregiver participation in care map workshops, let's just say the answer at the beginning of the workshop is different than the answer at the end of the workshop. At the beginning of the workshop, you know, let's just say about perhaps over the many, many workshops we've done, let's just say half of them came in self-identifying as caregivers. The others came in, you know, I'm a social worker, I'm a doctor, I'm whatever. Um, by the end of the workshop, I can guarantee you it's 100% recognized that they are caregivers as they learn to see into their own lives and discover that caregiving is just a fundamental part of being human. And so I've had like, you know, just in a recent workshop, one of the country's major cancer surgeons who came in to learn about this thing, you know, maybe it's good for his clinic, he left having a very different perspective on his own life. 
So caregiving is universal. I actually have fundamental disagreements with the Rosalind Carter quote because it implies we're not always caregivers. Um, and then the other question about who is the biggest adopter, is it the social workers or the regular people? Again, the, the social workers and others have found it really, really valuable in their work. And so one could say that's a home run. On the other hand, it kind of pales in comparison to the impact that this has had on people in their personal lives. So whether they are social workers or doctors or just us normal people, the impact has been most profound when we've used it, when people have used it to look into their own lives. Jerry, do we have any more questions? Sorry, this is Jerry. Um, yeah, there's a couple more. Um, so one for Anne, which is, um, can you say just a little bit more about how a care core program would work, especially since there are always concerns about things like elder abuse and, and fraud, especially with an aging community? Sure, that's a great question. And uh, a care core really would need to focus, I would say, primarily, um, well, first of all, you need to organize folks at the local level who want to do this. And that's why I thought that care mapping um, uh, work that Rajiv does is so interesting because those are people who might want to be part of a care core. Um, but the training would have to be developed so that people really knew um, what to do, you know, when they're going into someone else's home. Uh, they would not be doing any medical care. They would not be duplicating the work of direct care workers. They would be doing what we refer to as instrumental activities of daily living, maybe some household assistance, companionship to reduce social isolation, and so forth. Um, so the training uh, would have to be developed, essentially. And so I talked a little bit about a toolkit, and that would basically sketch out what your responsibilities were as a Care Corps volunteer. And uh, to the point about elder abuse and fraud, screening would be absolutely essential, background checks, uh, which I think are essential in this day and age so that we know who we have, you know, in people's personal spaces. Um, a care core would need to basically be organized as a legal entity, so a toolkit that helps you figure out how to do that would be essential. Uh, some administrative management uh, parameters would be key. And I think the information uh, that is gathered, or, or that could be gathered uh, by volunteers, should be in some ways compiled and, and reported so that we know what this kind of, of service really does to help reduce social isolation and address needs. And we would need that reported in some way so that we could study it and, and know what the outcomes are. So there's a lot of work that would go in, really, uh, to creating a care core, and that would be true whether you did it at the federal level through a bill and, and started up there and went top down or you organized it at the local level. So I'd love to have the money to go develop a toolkit. Uh, so anybody listening who's interested in that, maybe we should talk. Thanks for the question. And we're uh, Sarah, I know we're at time, so I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you. Uh, so many thanks for taking the time to participate in the learning exchange. Uh, I want to thank our speakers for their enlightening presentations. They've provided us with a lot of information, and I encourage you all to explore the, um, the resources that they've shared. Special thanks to our moderators, Marianne and Jerry Lynn, as well as our sponsors, Vocera and Accenture. A uh, few save the dates. So the learning exchange continues, and our next webinar will be held on August 22nd, 2 to 3 Eastern. Theme is translating the patient story into action. Um, and then on uh, September 11th from 1 to 2 Eastern, we have an another webinar scheduled called Digital Hype Versus Reality. Uh, both of these are obviously virtually, but if you'd like to meet up in person, make sure not to miss our conference, uh, Democratizing Healthcare, Me, You, Us, health, uh, hashtag Healthocracy, which will be held on October 17th in Boston leading up to the Connected Health Conference. And then lastly, I encourage you, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, lastly, I encourage each and every one of you to submit your work, whether it's research, thesis you're in the midst of, policy you're helping to advance, an online community you've created, or a best practice uh, or hack you've created as a participatory patient, caregiver, clinician, 
If it falls under the umbrella of participatory medicine, we encourage you to share and become a contributor to the learning exchange. Uh, you can submit your work using the, the link below. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. If you're not a member, we welcome you to join the society. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.